Mary for sharing and um, giving us some time of solitude and quiet and reflection. Boy, we need that many times after a week, don't we? And I hope you use those offertory moments for that. Well, you may have uh, remember Alan saying this morning during his announcements that uh, many of us, many of the uh, saints here at Fairview are in small prayer groups right now. I think we have close to 15, and they've been meeting weekly and through a guided prayer time have been praying for Fairview Church, uh, praying for renewal, praying for vision from God about where God is leading themselves and Fairview into the future. And so for the next several weeks, as we gather together in worship, I'm going to go back to that guide, and we're going to look at each week that you and your prayer groups are talking about, or if you're not in a prayer group, about some of the themes that some of your friends around you are looking at. Now, as we look at this in sermon form, use this as a guide. Uh, use this as motivation. Use this as teaching to wherever you are in your spiritual journey right now. You know, we're all at different places at any given time. We're all on this journey to mature and be more like Jesus. And we're not always at the same place, but we gather together with the hope of growing closer to him a little bit every day. So these are going to be ways, steps, that you can be renewed in your own personal faith. And they're the same steps that we as a body of Christ are renewed together as church. So today we want to look at the first step in, in being renewed or have revival in our own hearts. And that is we have to truly answer the question. We truly must be ready to say yes to are you open to be transformed by God? Are you spiritually open? Do you want to be transformed by God? Now, Jesus is uh, speaking in Mark chapter 4 about this very thing. And we'll talk about more about this in a minute. He uh, gives a very familiar parable to those of us or those of you that have read your Bible and studied your Bible for years. In fact, I, in Mark, I believe this is, if not the first parable he tells, one of the first. And he's telling this parable near the beginning of his ministry for a reason. It's the parable of the sower or the different types of soils. Now, after he tells the parable, he gets alone with his disciples in the fourth chapter, and in verse 13, he interprets the parable for them. One of the few times he does this. This is what Jesus says. Verse 13, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like the seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life and deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, 
and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord today. Well, for personal and church renewal to begin, we have to be ready to be changed. That's what renewal involves, especially in our life with Jesus. Jesus' kingdom, what he calls us to in salvation, is a radical concept. It was radical 2,000 years ago, and it is radical today. Jesus' kingdom sometimes shocks us. It sometimes shocks us to what Christ asks us to do with our lives and with we as a church family. Uh, Christ's kingdom can change us in ways. It can change our point of view, and it certainly can shake us up. Shake us up so much we wonder in our own hearts or as a church body, do we really want to change? Don't we want to just keep going along as we always have been? It certainly is much more comfortable. And as we vision and as we dream and as we plan uh, where we believe God is leading us as a man or woman, boy or girl, as a family, as a church family, uh, and what's in the future for us, there's going to be many responses to the call to renewal and many different um, many different views to the call to change. Believe it or not, not everybody likes change. <laughs> Believe it or not, everybody doesn't like doing things different. Believe it or not, even as individual, when God asks you to do something different, you're going to resist that many times at first. Moses did, Gideon did, <clears throat> David did, and you are. Sometimes you're going to have to be convinced. You know, it was no different in Jesus' day. And, and I think, in one way, this is what this parable is about. Jesus is telling this at the beginning of his ministry. And you can imagine him beside the sea in a boat with a lot of people gathered around him on a little tiny mount and with a lot, a multitude of people that are around him. And he begins to teach. And he is saying in this parable, the kingdom of God that has began with me coming in the world is going to bring about shocking change. The kingdom of God, what you're going to hear me teach about, what you're going to see me doing in the next three years, what how the world is going to change when I'm crucified and when I am risen from the dead is going to shock your system. Israel, Judaism, he's telling his brothers and sisters, is never going to be the same. It's going to be massive changes. And he says, as you hear the word, as you hear this gospel, as you see this change happening before your eyes, not everybody is going to like it. And society is going to respond to this good news in different ways. And he says, let me share with you how different people are going to respond to the Word of God. Let me share with you how... Uh, the system as a whole is going, not everybody's going to like it. They're going to relate to it, react to it in different ways. And just as Jesus is talking to the people of his day, because Jesus' words are eternal, we're going to see how amazing it is he could be talking to us today, couldn't he? Because Jesus' words are the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. No more than in this parable is that true. So first of all, Jesus says some are going to hear the good news. 
Some are going to hear my story. Some are going to hear me to say to them, change your life. And they're going to be like those where seeds fell on the hard soil. Immediately, Satan is going to come in, take away the word that's been sown in them, and they're never even going to get a chance to germinate. You know, farmers the, in Jesus' day, they left rows between the crops. And uh, not only did they leave rows between the crops so that they could walk between them and care for the crop day to day while it, the seed grew and the harvest came, you know, to weed it and water it and not stomp on it, the rows between the crops were also the, became the everyday path and the road for all the citizens of the kingdom. You didn't have fences. Uh, you didn't have really even um, personal boundaries like we have in the U.S. where don't walk on my land. This is my land. You can't walk on it. If you're trying to get to a town, if you're going to visit your family or your neighbor, and, you know, Joe's farm was between, you just walked on Joe's farm. And you were kind enough to walk between the rows and not walk on their plants. You know, that was just common courtesy. So you can imagine as people walked on these paths between the rows, they just got harder and harder and harder, that soil, didn't it? And so when the farmer went to you know, throw the seed, uh, some of it fell on that path. It didn't have a chance. It had about as much a chance as growing as when I plant seeds at my house because I'm a terrible uh, grower of plants. And so they didn't grow. So Jesus says, that's kind of like some people's hearts when they hear the word of God when they hear the gospel preached, when, when they hear God's calling us to something new as a family, as a person, as a church body, it just falls on our hearts and it just bounces right off and we never hear it. Oh, there can be reasons for that. Maybe um, we just have a lack of interest. We have so many other interests going on in life that, you know, we... We come here on Sunday morning, and we're used to the routine. You've gotten up. Maybe you, you got ready at a little bit different time than the normal week of school and work. Uh, maybe you put on a little different clothes to come to church today. Uh, you know, whatever your routine is, here you are. You sit in a pew. You're trying your best to get through this sermon so you can get out of here, you know. And, uh, but it's what you do. You come, you see some friends, you sing some songs, but really, you know, your interest in going deep in the gospel of Jesus Christ, maybe because it's uh, not your fault, it just happens, it becomes routine, um, your interest is just not there. And so when you're challenged by Christ and his word, it just bounces off of you like seeds on a hard path. Maybe you just, maybe you're at a point where I've been doing this all my life. I know I should, but really, this is just irrelevant to the life and where I live now. And all of those reasons can be valid, except for really this is that life is not easy. Life is not easy lived alone. Life certainly is not easy and is not meant to be lived without Jesus. And there are consequences to our actions. Uh, there is sin in the world. There is pain. There is suffering. There is hardship. Death enters our world in our families and, and uh, in our friends. And we have to deal with grief. And we're reminded at those times in a more magnified way, I really need God. I really need Jesus. I really need to be surrounded by other believers. So there is a reason we gather. Amidst just that it's been your routine for years and years and years, there is a deeper reason why you are here today. 
And maybe you just haven't thought about that in a long time. So a part of renewal is going deep again, letting the seeds of the gospel penetrate the sameness and the routine and uh, find a little bit of soil and just think again, why am I really here? There's a reason down there. And one of those reasons is you know you have a need for the holy God. You have a need for Jesus. And so renewal requires us once again to say, yes, I do believe. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm excited about faith. And it also requires us to get to the point where we can say, yes, and I'm all in. I'm in because I believe. I'm in because Jesus has made a difference for my life. Now, the next type of soil, some of us hear the good news. We hear the call of renewal from Jesus. And um, it's what sometimes I've called, we're just good Sunday Christians. We, um, we hear Jesus describe it as seeds that fell on rocky ground. He says there in verse 16, in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they heard the word, immediately received it with joy. And they had no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Again, the, the uh, ground that they are planting these seeds on, it's not like ours. We think of rocky soil. I think of, you know, around here in Virginia, you dig in some soil, and there's all kinds of little pebbles and rocks, and, well, I can't find any dirt here. Or, you know, you dig in, in my flower bed, and, you know, the folk that built the house left a couple of chip bricks and cement. I got to dig through all of that and get that stuff out of there. But in Palestine... Uh, Jesus is talking about another issue is that just beneath the surface of a lot of the soil there was this thin layer of limestone. And you really didn't know where it was or where it wasn't. So you throw some seed down, it would uh, sprout and look like it was going to grow, but those roots would hit that limestone and it was so hot and scorching there that eventually the roots couldn't go deep enough to sustain the water, and they would just dry up and wither away. They really didn't have a chance. Now, people can be this way when they hear God's word, when they, they hear the call to renewal. They hear the wonderful message of Jesus. At first, they're swept off their feet in a wave of emotion. The difficulty is is that as men and women, we can't live our whole lives based on emotion, can we? We can't sustain a high level of emotion and depend on that to motivate us to be the Christians that God wants us to be. Emotions are fleeting. Uh, David Robinson back there, our head usher, I know right now he's like on a level 15 of emotion because the Washington Nationals have won two games and they're up 2-0, two games from the World Series. And I guarantee you David's pumped up about that. I'm going to ask David to do three more things for the church because he'll say yes to anything right now. <laughs> you know, he's He's excited. And, you know, but, you know, if the Nationals go on to be in the World Series and if they win four more games and they're World Series champions, for a while we're going to be excited. We're going to, our emotions are going to be high. But we're soon going to forget about that. That emotion's going to go down. And then all we're going to have to depend on are the Redskins. And, and we're going to be in big emotional trouble, you know, through the rest of football season. You know, emotions go up and they go down and, and it's like this roller coaster and bubbling emotional enthusiasm in our faith is a far cry from deep rooted 
joy that comes from daily knowing Jesus, isn't it? Joy lasts for the season. Joy lasts for eternity. Elated emotions can come and they can go. And so personal renewal not only demands, yes, I believe, and yes, I'm, yes, I am, and I'm in this for the long haul, but renewal demands a spiritual stick-to-it commitment, that I am sticking with Jesus, I'm committed to Jesus, I'm committed to what Christ has in store for me and my church through all kinds of emotional swings. Because there's going to be good times and there's going to be bad times. We know we may, you know, do some spiritual experimentation to see if this works in reaching people for Christ in our neighborhood. And some of these experiments are going to work. We're going to see people transform for Jesus. There's going to be some things that we do that are going to fall flat on their face. And we're going to look back and you're going to say, what in the world was the pastor thinking? He's crazy. Why do we even try that? And you're going to feel down. But through it all, we can't, you know, just base success on how we emotionally feel for it at the time. If we're driven and encouraged by God, to try something, to go deeper, we need to do it. It also speaks to the hearer that begins something but never finishes it. I'm famous for starting projects around the house and never finishing them. Have you ever been? I don't know if you're like that or not. Some people are really, are really good and focused. You know, they, they start a project, you know, they got to mend something in the house and they stay right with it till it's done and it's done right. I may start something Monday and you know, well, it'll it'll wait till January, you know. It's not gonna get hot again to July. I don't gotta fix that. I might just put it off. And and but in the spiritual life we cannot let things go. We have got to stay with it, stay the course and keep motivated. Now, something else can happen when we hear the word, when we're called to renewal, and that is we can become a strangled Christian, can't we? A strangled Christian. Verse 18, and others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful the palestinian farmer let's just say it he or she they were lazy the way they usually weeded the garden is they went through and they cut off the tops of the weeds maybe down to the ground to make it look good but they never pulled the weed up by the root and you know what happens the weed grows back. And pretty soon, you don't get a full crop because many, much of the crop is strangled by the roots of the weeds. And it can't grow and produce to its fullest. And that's what happens with us as Christians. Now, Jesus says the outside cares of the world can choke the life out of the believer. I thought about that. What what kind of outside cares did the typical Israelite have in Jesus' day? I mean, what did they have to choke out their worries? It had to be a simple life. They worried about getting up, having food for the day for their family, worshiping, going to bed. I mean, they didn't they didn't have to, they didn't have things that could distract them. They didn't have smartphones. You know, they didn't have Netflix. Uh, you know, they didn't have streaming. Uh, you know, they, they didn't have to Google everything. They didn't have to keep up with chats and text and all this stuff. They weren't, you know, distracted by shopping online and, uh, you know, getting things from Amazon every day. 
I mean, uh, if anything reads more modernly true to me, it's this. We have a lot of things that can choke, that can distract us from who God really wants us to be, don't we? Well, we've got some distractions in life. And what Jesus says is that, you know, if we let the other things of life, and, and what's happening, I think, to the church today, in society as a whole, is that we're being pushed to the margins. That, or we say, you know, my faith in God is one important part of my life. On Sunday, I'm giving that to God. That's pretty good. I'm giving one day to God, you know? But there's other days I've got to think about work. I've got to think about my family. I've got to think about school. I've, you know, I've got to think about friends. I, I've got to think about, you know, my hobbies and my passions. And I have all these 10 or 12 or 15 things swirling around. Jesus is one of them. And what Jesus says, if you try to do that, the other things are going to strangle him from being the most effective in you. And then you're going to wake up one day, and it's not, it just happened gradually. You know the frog in the kettle illustration, right? You know, you, you get a, you boil a pot of water and get it boiling hot. If you throw a frog in there, what's that frog going to do? Ouch! <laughs> you know, he's going to burn something. We won't say what. But he's going to hop out of there. If you put a frog in a kettle of room temperature water that's comfortable, that frog's going to swim around and start making a little home. And you turn up the gas and the heat, and you turn that kettle up to boiling water, that frog will never leave the kettle and will just burn himself up. We gradually let things choke us out of our spiritual life, and then all of a sudden we wake up one morning and we say, I've become too busy to pray. I've become too preoccupied to daily study the Word of God. I, I've gotten so involved in committees and good works at church that I've left no time to spend with the reason and source of the good works, Jesus. It gradually happens, and all of a sudden we wake up and we say, bro, bro <laughs> you know, <laughs> how did this happen? William Barclay says, it's not the things which are obviously bad that are dangerous. It's the things which are good. The second best is always the worst enemy of the best. And that can happen. As 21st century Christians... We need to make room in this crowded world to grow our heart and our minds so that we can bear fruit for Christ. And you know, that's where we want to be. We, we really, our heart, I think, desires, we want to be like that last, that last soil, don't we? The last place where the seeds fall. Uh, there are some are the ones whom seed was sown on the good ground. And they hear the word and accept it and, and bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. True renewal, we know that it takes place when we begin bearing fruit for Christ. We will see others saved. We will see others growing as disciples. It may not be 100, 200, 300 at a time, but we will see people's lives being changed if we're together as Fairview, laser-focused on growing as disciples and doing his work in the world. The evidence will be we'll see people become new believers. We'll see, um, I told you, right after business meetings, my second favorite service is baptism. I, and I love baptism business meetings, but, but baptisms are right up there. And uh, we'll see people being baptized, and we'll see people enter into discipleship, and we'll see their lives not transformed by us, but by Jesus. And then all of a sudden, they're going to share their faith with somebody else. They're going to make disciples, and we're going to see the kingdom begin to grow. That's what Jesus says. It will happen with some people. 
that will, the, the word is going to fall in your heart so much and it's going to grow in you so much you can't be do anything you're so excited you're so filled with God that you're going to share him with others so the questions today for renewal personally what is your passion what is your passionate goal as a believer why do you really really love Jesus what's your goal your end goal as a believer and as a church, and I think the, in the prayer group, the guide said, Peter Drucker's question, as a church, what business are we in as a church? What is to be our business at Fairview that's, that's going to make us sacrifice and work hard for joyfully? That we just can't wait to get here or in our life do something for the Lord's church because we're so passionate about it. At Fair, as Fairview, are in the next 10 or 15 years, are we going to be survival focused? You know, our main goal is going to be how do we keep these doors from closing? Or to say today, if our doors close today, would anybody in this community miss us? Would anybody miss us? Or with the city of Fredericksburg re rejoicing, great, church is going, we're going to put a business in there and get some taxes out of that place, finally. Is anybody going to miss us? Are you ready to be transformed, renewed by the living God? Or are you thinking right now, I've I got to get home to the pot roast and uh, watch the Redskins play? That's up to you. I know what God's calling us to do. What ground are you? Where are the seeds falling in your heart today? That's the first part of renewal. Are we ready to be transformed by God? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word that's eternal. It's amazing, Lord, that um, your lesson to us today rings through the ages and here we are in 2019 ready to hear your word again open us up to receive your word not ours throw away all of our ideas of how to grow in you and please teach us through your spirit in Jesus name amen